Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk about two different books that both discuss artistic rivalries. One of them deals with literature, the other one deals with art, but both of them discuss complicated relationships between creatives that blend friendship and competition, love and resentment, just a whole host of emotions. These are artists after all. Given that this is a book channel, I figured we would start off by discussing the book focused on literary figures. It's also the shorter of the two books I'm going to talk about today. It's called The Feud, Vladimir Nabokov, Edmund Wilson, and the End of a Beautiful Friendship by Alex Beam. This book was published in 2016 by Pantheon, which is a part of Random House. And my hardcover copy that I purchased with my own money comes in at 224 pages. This book is about the rise and the fall of a friendship between two literary giants of the mid 20th century. Though you may not have heard of him, Edmund Wilson, whose nickname was Bunny, he was a really big deal in the New York City literary scene of the 1940s. He was an author, a critic, an intellectual. He had a lot of connections in New York City. And when Vladimir Nabokov was hoping to move to America in 1940, his cousin, Vladimir Nabokov's cousin, knew Edmund Wilson and knew how well connected he was. So he connected the two of them to help out his cousin. So that is how Edmund Wilson met Vladimir Nabokov, who you probably have heard of. Nabokov grew up in Russia in an aristocratic family. His father actually served in the provisional government, which was the government set up between the two different revolutions in 1917. But once the Bolsheviks had their second revolution, that's when the family fled Russia. And later on down the line, Nabokov's father was actually murdered for political reasons. And even though Nabokov would wander for the rest of his life. He did eventually settle down in America and stay there for an extended period of time. But he was always pining after the Russia of his youth. At the time that Wilson and Nabokov met in 1940, Nabokov was already a prolific author and poet. And when Wilson read some of Nabokov's stuff, he was really impressed. And he made sure to spread that news all over town. Wilson told his publisher about Nabokov, this new talent. He helped Nabokov get writing jobs. He told him how to deal with editors and negotiate for pay raises. He was a mentor to Nabokov, and he gave him a financial lifeline and all of these invaluable connections. These two also very rapidly became close friends, and they remained good friends for years after. They didn't always agree on everything, but they were very fond of one another. There was a little bit of animosity in the friendship, as you can expect with most friendships. And I do think that started to build after Vladimir Nabokov published Lolita to enormous success, to put it mildly, whereas Edmund Wilson's fiction was not nearly as well received. It wouldn't be until the late 1950s that fault lines would start appearing in this friendship. That started to happen after the publication of Pasternak's Dr. Dr. Zhivago. The two of them really disagreed about Dr. Zhivago. But the real rift between these two happened when Edmund Wilson panned Vladimir Nabokov's huge and frankly ridiculous translation of Alexander Pushkin's Yevgeny or Eugene Onegin in the New York Review of Books. An absolute war erupted between these two after that, and a lot of it went down in the letters section of various publications. This book, The Feud, details the backgrounds of both of these writers. It talks about their friendship, how they built up the friendship, and then it's very sad dissolution and all the different incidents that led up to that, mainly the panning of that wretched sounding translation. I gotta say, the descriptions of that translation in this book, The Feud, are absolutely hilarious. Just in case you don't know anything about the epic poem Eugene Onegin, let me give you a little bit of context. Eugene Onegin is known as a virtually untranslatable work. And that poem specifically is known for that because of the way that Pushkin plays with the Russian language in it. It doesn't really translate to any other language. So when a translator is taking on an effort like this, they have one of two different choices. They can choose to be faithful to the content of the poem and make sure that is apparent to the reader of the translated work, 
or they can decide that they want to maintain the style and the structure, but then they'll have to take some liberties with the content. Like it just doesn't make for a one-to-one -one translation. But apparently that really upset Nabokov. He wanted to keep all the content and keep the style. But in order to be able to achieve that, he had to basically butcher the English language. It also took him eight years. Apparently the work has footnotes galore. It just sounds awful. I've never read it. I don't have any desire to. I would much rather take on a different translation, but it just sounds really bad. I honestly don't blame Edmund Wilson for ripping it apart. But then again, should Wilson have written that review, knowing it would probably cost him the friendship? No, I don't think he should have. There were plenty of other reviewers who roasted that translation, including some who knew more about the Russian language than Wilson did, so they were better qualified to do it and they weren't personal friends with Nabokov. He could have just chosen not to talk about it, but he did. Honestly, not that this video is about determining who was right in this situation, but I think both of them acted arrogant, childish, and it cost them something really valuable. This was a really entertaining read, albeit in the, I can't believe how pretentious these two men were kind of way. The author does a really good job presenting their story without really taking sides. You never really felt that he was on one man's side as opposed to the other. And you could also really feel that he had a lot of fun writing this book, especially when he was discussing that vicious ping pong match between these two and the various literary publications. But I will say throughout this book, I didn't think there was nearly enough commentary coming from the author on what these two men would have been thinking and feeling as their friendship was disintegrating. I mean, this author obviously would have come to know these two men pretty well through reading their works and reading their correspondence, knowing their backgrounds. Like he probably had some guesses on what was going on internally inside both of these men, but he didn't really put that down on the page as he was presenting the events. So overall, I I thought this was a fun read, but ultimately a little bit unsatisfying because of that lack of commentary. But I am sure this one will be of great interest to all of you Vladimir Nabokov fans out there, or you Edmund Wilson fans, if there are any of you out there. <laughs> but the other book I'll be discussing in this video is called The Art of Rivalry, for Friendships, Betrayals, and Breakthroughs in Modern Art by Sebastian Smee. This book was also published in 2016 by Random House, and my hardcover copy copy, which I also bought with my own money, comes in at 416 pages. This book is substantially longer than its rival in this video, but that's because it's much more ambitious in scope. In this book, four complicated relationships between famous artists are discussed at length. So first, there are the figurative artists, Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon, who had a very volatile relationship and seemed to have a policy of mutually assured self-destruction. The next relationship that's discussed in the book is the mainly friendly one between two impressionists, the good-natured Edouard Manet and his darker counterpart, Edgar Degas, that was shaken by the defilement of a very personal painting. The modern artists, Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse, are the next pairing to be discussed in the book. These two were extremely extremely competitive with one another, but they actually seem to hold each other in pretty high regard on a personal level. And then finally, there are the abstract painters. The unlikely success, Jackson Pollock and his elder, Willem de Kooning, who competed with one another, but kind of in a little brother, big brother kind of way, what with their one-upmanship and roughhousing. In order to keep this video a respectable length, <laughs> I'm not going to be going into detail about these four relationships in the way that I did when discussing the previous book. That was just one relationship, whereas in this book there are four. And suffice it to say that this book is extremely thorough. Each friendship gets about 80 to 90 pages in this book, and each section is filled to the brim with information. You get biographical information on both of the artists. You hear about their work. You hear about how their work evolved over the course of the friendship. Then you learn about the friendship itself, how it started, how it evolved, how it dissolved, if it did. There is just so much information in this book. And because of that, I'm not sure this is the best choice of book for anyone who doesn't already have a substantial amount of knowledge about art. I am interested in art, 
but admittedly, I don't understand it very much. I try to because of my interest, but I could never really feel in this book like I had my footing, like I understood fully what was going on. So I got as much as I could out of this book, but I could definitely see someone with a background in art or art history getting a lot more out of this. What I did really enjoy about this book was the inclusion of speculation on the author's part on what would have been going on inside these personal relationships. That's exactly what I felt was missing from the previous book, The Feud. And it was so much fun to read about what he thought may have been going on between the two different artists. And actually, a lot of the historical information that he presents throughout the book is meant to support those guesses. It's meant to hold up his theory. And that aspect of the book also gave these stories such an incredibly huge human side to them. I think the most interesting chapter in this book, for me, a non-artist, was the Manet Degas chapter. And I think I liked it so much for two different reasons. The first one being that these two people, out of all of the artists discussed in this book, seemed like they were the most decent people. Definitely still flawed but decent. I mean, Manet was known as being incredibly likable, like during his lifetime, it was very easy to be fond of him. And you can definitely feel that as you read this section. But that chapter also has a mystery element, because the reason why there was a fracture in the relationship between Manet and Degas is that Manet, Mr. Nice Guy, actually slashed a painting that Degas was doing. And it wasn't just any painting. It was a wedding portrait that Degas was doing of Manet and his new wife. And Manet slashed it in a very specific area. It is still not entirely clear why he did that. But the author has, I think, a really solid theory as to why he did. And it has to do with this secret life that Manet was forced to lead for most of his life. It is fascinating. But the introduction to this book is really intriguing as well, because the author discusses the nature of these four relationships, what they did to these people, but also what they did for these people. I know the word rivalry has a negative connotation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that these relationships were always bad. Sure, a rivalry can mean that things get competitive or they get toxic, but also that competitive feeling can and did drive these artists to be better. The four relationships discussed in this nonfiction book were very complex and are probably impossible to fully describe in words, even though the author does a really good job of characterizing those relationships in this book. But as you could probably tell from my brief little overviews of the relationships I gave at the beginning of this section, each one of these relationships had its own distinct flavor, if you will. And I think that definitely does send the message that there's no one way to be in a rivalry. And a rivalry isn't something completely negative. It can have positive sides to it as well. I mean, most of these relationships were also friendships, even if they did fall out eventually. All of it is just so interesting to think about. So my final verdict on this one is that it's an interesting book. It's definitely very thorough. I would say it's worth reading, but I think you're going to get the most out of it if you're already an art lover. Now, even though this is a duo review and it is all about rivalries, I'm not going to pit these two authors against each other, even though they did both write for the Boston Globe which I thought was kind of a funny detail. And both of these books were published in the same year, kind of under the same publisher umbrella. I could pit these two books against each other if I wanted to and say which one is better. But I don't think it's fair to do that because these two books have completely different subject matters. They are just two totally different things. I will say, though, that I read The Feud first and I read The Art of Rivalry second. And I thought a lot of Sebastian Smith these insights on the pros and cons of having a rival really spoke to the relationship between Edmund Wilson and Vladimir Nabokov. So if you're interested in both of these books, I think they do make a good pairing because one speaks to the other in that way. But if you only want to read one of these books, if you want to pick between the two of them, then you should ask yourself what you're more in the mood for. If you want something about literature, 
then it should be The Feud. If you want something about art, then it should be The Art of Rivalry. If you want something short, easy to get through, then The Feud would be more for you. If you want something longer, more ponderous, something you can sink into, then The Art of Rivalry would be the way to go. I myself enjoyed both of these about equally, so this fight ends in a draw. But those were my thoughts on these two books, both about artistic rivalries. Both of them will be linked in the description box below for your clicking convenience. Do let me know if one or even both of these caught your interest, or if you know of any books that are similar to these that you could personally recommend. You can let me know that, or any more general comments or questions you may have in the comment section below. And if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, where I'm the most active. The links to all of my profiles will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.